Hi there everyone, welcome to today's webinar. My name's Sarah, I'm from Myosh. Um, before I introduce Scott Coleman, um, I just want to, well, first of all, the topic today is using sports science and wearable technology to automatically and remotely reduce injury risks. Um, we will have a um, Q&A session at the end, so please use that section on the webinar panel to ask any questions. If you want to send me a question directly, use the chat panel, we will be recording the webinar and we will send out a link to the uh, re webinar recording and a podcast too if that's easier for people tomorrow and a copy of the slides. So um, this webinar is going to be presented by Scott Coleman. He's the Managing direct Director of Preventure. Scott has become an industry leader in workplace injury prevention through his innovative and comprehensive approach using, using wearable technology. This approach evolved from the combination of over 20 years of experience working with elite athletes. Um, as a coach, physiotherapist and biomechanics with the skills developed working in private practice treating injured workers. So thank you so much for joining us today, Scott. Over to you. Great. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks, everyone, for, um, for deciding to spend some of your valuable time with us. Hopefully you'll take away some, um, some information and, and um, look, at, look at how the future of, of injury prevention and injury management may look um, given our current situation, but also given how technology is evolving and developing and making it more cost effective and more practical to use in the workplace. So throughout the webinar, uh, we're basically going to go through current problems with workplace injury prevention and return to work, the rehab side of things. We're going to go through the effective injury prevention methods and technology, specifically coming out of the elite sports industries, elite sports world and how we translate these methods into the workplace in a cost-effective and sustainable way. So current problems, a lot of this you, you guys will already um, be familiar with, the current problems with injury prevention programs, and there are problems. We all know the statistics are, um, they're not changing a lot. There's still a high frequency of musculoskeletal disorders and the cost of back and shoulder injuries aren't changing too much from year to year. They might be decreasing a little bit, but they're still way too high. So when it comes to avoidable injuries, they should be a lot lower through effective injury prevention programs. So the current problems are due to uh, education and training methods being ineffective at changing behaviour. We know you can get workers off the site and put them in a room and show them a PowerPoint. They see that as an hour off work. They, none of it sinks in. And um, a lot of the time, it's cost, it, it is quite costly, especially if you're getting um, external consultants in to do it. And it doesn't really reduce the injury risk. Research has shown that it doesn't, that it doesn't, that form of education doesn't change the worker's behavior. Very limited by time and resources, especially face-to-face -face based training and feedback. Um, you, these days, especially with remote working, um, delivering safety training to groups is, is less likely. It's also delivering safety training one-on-one -on -one is less cost effective. So, the current process needs to, it's not scalable. It needs to be able to be delivered to large groups over big geographical areas. The approaches are not specific to individual injury risks. So there's, I've come across in the last five years being coming across from sports injury prevention across to the workplace injury prevention industry. I've found that there's a lot of blanket approaches. There's a lot of safe lifting methods and safe operating procedures. And a lot of the time they're too general and they don't address or they don't identify the individual injury risks to begin with, but they don't address them. So the key is identifying the risks for the individual. We know every individual worker, every work task, every work site have their own unique injury risk. So if you don't identify and address them, then you're not gonna um, reduce injury rates. Assessments are observation and opinion based. I was really surprised that the first few safe operating procedures and work task assessments and risk assessments I came across in the workplace, and they were very much the opinions and observations of and photos of the um, the safety professional. There was no real data collected, which it adds a whole new layer once you once you measure movements and add data as opposed to relying on just opinions and observations of safety professionals. And the future of face to face training is changing now, given that. Um, we've got this social distancing and we've got the, you can't get large groups together for, for the traditional methods of injury prevention training. So the most effective injury prevention programs occur in the world of elite sport. 
primarily due to a process called TRIP, which we'll get to on the next slide. But basically, it involves a lot more research, a lot more investment in money, but a lot more information collected and decisions based off data. But you need to measure movement quality as well as quantity. So in the workplace, we know that quantity is the factor. Don't bend too far, don't reach too high. But for everyone listening to this webinar, if we all stood up and slowly bent forward and touched our toes, the range is considered hazardous, but it's actually a really good stretch. You stretch, you open up the joints, you stretch the muscles, you stretch the connective tissue. However, you perform the exact same movement, the same range, if you move, if you flex your spine the same way, but if you do it really fast and explosive, then it is a high injury risk. It's no longer a good stretch for your back. And that's the quality of movement, not just the quantity. So I did discover early on a lot of health and safety injury prevention um, programs focus on the quantity, how far the worker moved, but completely neglected the quantity of the, the quality of the movement, sorry, how the movement was done and how efficiently or inefficiently the movement was done. And it's important to establish specific baselines using load. Now, load is a concept that came into sports injury prevention about 10, 15 years ago, where it was a universal measure to, that was calculated using multiple variables. But it was a measure that where the coaches or the physios or the sports medicine team could go and see a baseline based off a number and they could see if, a, if an athlete's number was higher or lower than that number. So a load is, and this is how it was defined when we were at the AIS, load is the process of quantifying the amount of physical training that an athlete undertakes using variables relevant for their sport. Now that can very easily be translated across to the workplace. So load is a process of quantifying the amount of physical work that a worker undertakes using variables relevant to their work tasks or relevant to their occupation. So the TRIP model, translating research into injury prevention practice. It involves six stages. Um, so in the, in the sport, each stage is very, there's a lot of heavy emphasis on each stage, which is why it's become quite successful. In the workplace, however, stage one, stage two are quite common. There's a lot of injury surveillance. There's a lot of information about the um, mechanisms of injury. Stage five and six are also quite, um, quite developed. However, stage three and four, there's a big gap in the workplace. Developing preventative measures and the ideal conditions for evaluation, which is basically collecting data, measuring the workers' movements. So this is where wearable technology and sports methodology can really make a big impact in workplace health and safety and workplace injury prevention. So the preventative measures involve primary prevention, which is task assessments and screening. Health and safety traditionally does this quite well. As I mentioned, task assessments can be a little bit objective and um, involve observation. However, they are at least the, the value of them is known. Screening, pre-employment screening is a key and it's very commonly used as an injury prevention, primary prevention method. It's the secondary prevention where the health and safety industry is really lacking. And that's the early detection of onset of injury. Tertiary prevention is quite good as well, which is that return to work the rehab to prevent re-injury, to get a worker back to the physical condition where they can perform the task and prevent re-injury. But it's the secondary prevention where there's a lot of gains that can be made. So these are the three phases of secondary prevention as, as defined in sports medicine. You've got the biological onset where there are microscopic changes in the tissue due to overload. And that can only be detected through data analysis and monitoring over time. You see changes in load, you know, that if there is a significant increase in the load or decrease in the load with deconditioning, which we'll get to later, then you know that there will be biological onset of tissue breakdown or tissue deconditioning. But you can't uh, actually, well, the only way you can detect it is by taking muscle biopsies or blood samples, which isn't, isn't practical. The second part, the second um, phase is the detectable signs. That's where you've got workers with niggles, with tightness, with aches and pains. And that's an area, so those two, the latent period before an injury um, is diagnosed or before pain is, is, signs and symptoms emerge, that's where workplace injury prevention can really step forward. So detecting biological onset through data analysis, but also identifying the detectable signs, educating workers to, um, I, to 
look for niggles, aches and pains, stiffness, tightness, and then giving them a process to follow to nip them in the bud before they progress to the injury phase where they lose time and they're in pain and then it becomes a claim and then it, then the, um, the psychosocial element really starts to kick in. That's that latent period where wearable technology and sports science methodology can really help reduce injuries. The monitoring load for this secondary prevention phase. Simply measuring range of motion is not enough as we spoke about, but there are different types of load. External load is the biomechanical load, that how they physically move. Internal load is the physiological load, so how their body responds to the external load. Is their heart rate going up or down? Is their temperature going up or down? Chronic load is measuring the physical workload over a longer period. So that could be defined as one shift, that could be defined as one roster cycle, one week, and then acute load, which is the task, the physical demands of the specific task that the worker is undertaking. And this is a really exciting concept that's gonna emerge in health and safety in the next probably four or five years once the data is um, starting to accumulate, but it's this chronic, acute chronic load ratio. And this is now the biggest predictor of injury risk in athletes in, a, in the repetitive loading sports like rowing or swimming or athletics, where it's the, the ratio between the acute load, which is that for sports, it's the acute load of a particular part of a training session or a competition. Whereas in the workplace, the acute load would be a specific task. So if you get that ratio between the physical demands of specific tasks with the overall chronic load of the shift, then you can identify whether those workers are at risk, uh, accurately identify whether those workers are at a high injury risk or not. And this is basically the research behind it. So the last five years in sports science has really focused on this acute chronic ratio. And they've found that there is the data fits into this chart where you've got this sweet spot in the middle where that acute chronic workload ratio is perfect and the injury risk is the lowest. Now where that sweet pot spot is depends on the sport, depends on the task, depends on the data collected. So we can interpret, basically interpret that as meaning in the workplace, the sweet spot for different occupations needs to be determined. So it's not just a matter of taking the, the acute chronic ratio for this particular chart to be around one, taking that to workplaces and saying, all right, we want an acute chronic ratio of one. That's where we're going to run with. You need to collect a lot of data before you can identify where that sweet spot is. Below the sweet spot where the, there's not enough acute load and the chronic load is higher, then there's an injury risk as there is at the other end of the spectrum, the real danger zone, where the acute chronic ratio is quite high, meaning that the physical demands of the acute load over the chronic load are a high predictor of injury risk. But again, it's about collecting data, and as the data is collected over time, correlating that with uh, niggles, with claims, with injuries, to see exactly what that ratio looks like. So how do we calculate load? I've been talking about load for a while. It's Calculated using variables specific to the physical demands of what the worker is performing. So this is these are all the variables that are used in sports. They so can see there's quite a few. You could go to three different AFL clubs or three different rugby league clubs, and each would have their own secret formula of how they calculate load. But they would all have a load calculation. They would have a baseline. They would have and they would know exactly where each of the players fit on that spectrum, whether they're above, below the baseline, where, and where, what they need to do to reduce injury risk by managing that load. So every gone are the days where a whole team would turn up to training and they'd all have exactly the same training session. These days, with most professional teams, every individual athlete has their own training program based off their load. So this is based off all of these variables combined based off the, the emphasis, the different weighting that the club or the, the different sports find are more relevant. So the question is, what do we do in the workplace? So as I said, there's internal load, which can be measured using RPE wellness questionnaires. We know they're not particularly accurate in the workplace. In sports, they are. If an athlete says the RPE for a particular session was nine out of 10, you know that they are judging that based off the physical demands, but also the overall goal of what they're there for. Whereas in the workplace, 
if you're measuring RPE for a particular amount of work, they could tell you an answer that they think their manager wants to hear. They could tell you an answer that's overinflated so that they then reduce the amount of work. So we know that RPM wellness questionnaires aren't particularly valid and reliable in the workplace. Heart rate is, but not many workers want to have their heart rate measured because they see it as a perception of effort. So if their heart rate's not high enough, the manager might think they're not working hard enough. Or if their heart rate's too high, the manager might think they're unfit. So there's all these perceptions of heart rate. Galvanic skin resistance is a stress response. Uh, again, that's a bit more intrusive. Not too many workers are keen to have their stress response or sympathetic nervous system activity measured and monitored to see whether they're coping with the stress of the environment that they're working in. It would have, I mean, it's a brilliant measure and it would have a lot of value in certain environments like on an offshore mine rig or something like that, oil, oil rig, but it is a bit too intrusive and most workers, there tends to be a bit of pushback as there is with temperature. Temperature and a heart rate are um, very strongly linked. VO2 and blood lactate are almost purely for a sports environment. You're not going to be able to go to a workplace and collect bloods and VO2s, although it is the best measure of internal physical load. External load, however, biomechanical load is easy to measure. Time and duration of the task, that's, we've been measuring that for, for years. Accelerometry is the one that's really starting to pick up. That's measuring the physical movements of the task or throughout the shift. GPS, we, we started with early on, um, when I started transitioning from sports-based injury prevention to the workplace, I was using the same GPS devices that the athletes wear, the, the lump in the top of their jersey that you'll see in most sports. I was using the same thing, and that's where there was a bit of pushback from unions and workers, basically because of the tracking. They didn't want their workers tracked, or they didn't want to be tracked throughout the shift. So having their measurements, or having their movements measured when they're doing tasks is one thing, being tracked and traced around where they've been throughout the whole shift, that tends to be um, a bit too intrusive. Force dynamometry and power is an interesting one. We found early on I was measuring a lot of force and a lot of um, power generation for specific tasks. But I found you can measure the amount of force required to perform a task. You can then get 10 workers to do it and each of them would move in different ways to generate that force. So the value wasn't necessarily in measuring the force required to do a task. It was measuring the way the workers moved to generate that force and then identifying which of those workers were moving in efficient ways or inefficient ways. And the inefficient ways were obviously a higher injury risk. So we shifted quite quickly away from measuring force, dynamometry and power. It's good for task modification if you're trying to reduce the amount of force required to perform a task. But if the amount of force is, is inflexible, if you have to generate a certain amount of force, that's when it's the movements of the workers that's of, of more value rather than the force um, measurements itself. So time and accelerometry are the easiest, they're the most valuable measurements of external load that we can um, use to reduce injury risk in the workplace. So accuracy and validity of wearable tech. Wearable tech is the best way to measure time and measure the accelerometer, um, collect the accelerometer data. However, a lot of what, what a lot of people don't realise is that our, the, a lot of the wearable tech that we use every day, whether it be a smartwatch or whether it's the accelerometers on your phone or Fitbits, the error rate's actually quite high. So you've got body media is the best on this scale on the left there at 9% error. But if you go up to your um, Fitbit, so if you've got a Fitbit, the number of steps counted in that Fitbit could be 10% higher or lower in reality. So that's just the error of your Fitbits. Um, and that goes across all wearable tech. You've got this level of error that needs to be incorporated and known. So it's incorporated into our algorithms because of this fact that if the error is not accounted for, then you can end up with misleading data. So how do we calculate load? It needs to be practical, it needs to be user-friendly, and it needs to be cost-effective. In sports, a lot of the time when you're measuring blood lactates, it's not practical user-friendly, it doesn't matter if it's user-friendly in sports because that's their job. So they'll do their training and then they'll spend time with the sports science team providing information, providing data. In the workplace, it needs to be, it needs to integrate with operations because workers don't want to waste time when they've got work to do in providing data to reduce injury risk. The most important is going to be cost-effective. Early on, there was a lot of wearable tech coming into the workplace injury prevention sphere that was not cost-effective. And as a result, there, there was no point in actually integrating it because people were spending a lot of money to basically get data to prove what they already knew. So 
They need to be cost effective to be used to answer questions, not just to collect data for the sake of collecting data. So the key is monitoring versus reducing the load. So this chart shows training load of a, of a well-known Australian athlete leading up to a competition and the peaks and troughs wasn't just the peaks where the injury risk was high, it's the troughs as well due to deconditioning. There was a really good study done back in 2008, I think, 2009, where they looked at injury, hamstring injury rates in AFL players. And there was one particular year, I think it was the year before, where there was a high rate of in hamstring injuries in the first few rounds of the, of the competition, the first few weeks of the season. And they dug a bit deeper and they looked into what was happening those first few weeks. And it wasn't necessarily that the clubs that had high rates of hamstring injuries in those first few weeks weren't doing anything different at the start of the season. But the end of their pre-season, they had reduced the level of high intensity training, particular sprinting, that high explosive sprinting, they started to reduce because they didn't want the athletes to get injured prior to the season starting. But what happened was they became deconditioned. And so that fast acceleration, that, that fast sprinting, when they got into a game environment, they had become slightly deconditioned to it and they were tearing their hamstring. So this is where it's not just about reducing load to reduce injury risk. It's about monitoring. So avoiding peaks and troughs is the key. Another example, there was, um, uh, we did some work for a, a dairy factory where they had a, a robotic picking machine that was packing pallets. So for years and years and years, for decades, the pallets to go on the trucks were packed by the workers. They lift the cheese, they lift the bear, the butter and the dairy, and they would put it on the pallet, wrap it up, and then the truck, the forklift will come and take it away. They integrated this this robotic um, packing. So the the order would come through, and this robotic arm would just pack the pallet and wrap it up, and away they go. So these workers had become deconditioned because they'd gone from physical work to pushing a button, operating this machine, and then. And they, they weren't happy with that. They would explain that they don't feel fit and healthy like they used to when they were younger because they don't do any physical work anymore. But then when the machine broke down, they would then have to get out and pack the pallets at a higher rate because the machine would do it at a higher rate. And that's when they had to get injured. And there was a lot of back injuries because of that. The workers were becoming deconditioned and then being asked to do that physical load that they once were able to do. And that's when they, they were breaking down. So reduced load equals deconditioning. So the key is monitoring load, not just reducing load. What is the optimal load? So the key is establishing baselines for each occupation, task and location. The most effective baselines are the average. And we know an average is only as valuable as the amount of data that goes into it. So the more data you collect over a long period, the more you can establish good baselines, which is average. If you know what the average back load is and what the average arm load is for a shift for a particular occupation, there's your baseline. If a worker comes in at the end of the shift, so this chart shows progressive load during the shift from our dashboard, this particular worker came in below the average for that, sh for that shift, which is the dotted lines. So they, you, you know, their load for that particular shift was below their baseline. If it went, if those lines, the orange and the blue line passed through the dotted line, Early in the shift, you would know that the, for the rest of that shift, fatigue is a problem because they've already surpassed the occupation average load for that shift. So they're having a very busy shift, so they need to be monitored and they need to be, that needs to be managed. Current solutions. We found early on that the best way to collect the data from the workers and to use it effectively was to connect sensors from the worker to the smartphone. The smartphone then sends it to the cloud where the data analysis occurs. And being in the cloud, the analysis can occur from anywhere around the country or anywhere around the world. And the worker can, the data can be collected from the worker anywhere around the world as well. So if it was user friendly, the workers could put on the sensors, connect their smartphone and away they go. And the difference, we, we realized the acute load, measuring the acute load, we needed to be able to measure that through the, the product. So we, um, the acute load is done in, through task assessments where safety professionals put the sensors on the worker and then they collect video through their smartphone as well. So you can see the lady there collecting video and data at the same time. There's your acute load measure, which is the specific task assessment. And then the chronic load is measuring and collecting data from workers throughout a full shift. 
and see you can get a, an hourly breakdown so you can distribute the load evenly throughout the shift but also you can monitor the progressive load throughout the shift and compare that to the baseline the averages now here's an example of a, a, a cute load so this is a um, particular task where this worker would have been told many many times don't unload bags from halfway up the ramp He's doing it anyway and while a safety professional would know, look at this and say, well, we don't need the data to identify that that's a high risk movement. The chart down the bottom has an, it sends a powerful message to the workers. So if we move, I'll show you how at the moment they're in isolation. While that video and that data line is interesting, it quantifies the physical demands. There is a bit of a, so what that's just spending money on putting numbers to something that we already know. So I'll show you how that can be better used in a little while. Now this is actually a chart I stole from Google. That, this is their machine learning um, framework, but I've put a worker in the middle where the machine learning um, algorithm sits because it works exactly the same. When we're looking at a worker, we can collect data and monitor the load and that can influence the worker's um, injury risk. That load monitoring data can also be incorporated into training, which then changes the worker's behavior and reduces their injury risk. But then you've got learning and you've got the experience that also influences the worker's behavior. So you've got those three elements that are capable of changing the worker's behavior and reducing the injury risk. Then if you measure the action and whether the outcome is positive or negative, that information then has to feed back into the experience side of the puzzle. So then there's this constant loop of adding more data through load monitoring using that and the experience to create better training, delivering the training to work in a more effective way, not in a classroom, we know that's not effective. So if we can use that, if we can train a worker in a more effective way, that would change their action and hopefully result in a better outcome. So this is how that information can be used. We've got um, the first part of this video shows how the data is collected from our app. So basically the worker's got the app on their phone, they connect to Movement Coach, um, connect the sensors, back and arm sensors by Bluetooth. Then they wear it throughout a shift and the sensors identify high load movements and, and counts up the high load movements throughout the shift. So the workers can receive alerts for return to work purposes. But at the end of the shift, the data that was collected, the number of high load movements can then determine what training they need to do. So it's not just a blanket approach. The data determines where the risk is and what modules, training modules, the workers need to do. This is where that video and data can become handy. So if, a, if the data shows a worker has a high injury risk because of control or because of movements that they were performing throughout the shift, they will receive this type of module where they will receive a video. They will, they will see the data. This is where this is important. So for safety professionals saying, well, yeah, it's just numbers showing us what we already know. If a worker sees it, it's completely different. Because in the past, they've been told by safety professionals, don't lift from mid-ramp, and it goes in one year out the other. But if they see a video of a colleague doing it and the spike in the chart, then it gets them thinking. You then add Q&A-based learning on top of it. That's where the worker learns from their mistakes or their knowledge is justified and it is managed. So that's where collecting data and video can be used in a much more effective way to change worker behaviour. So future solutions. So what we've got now is one step towards the future, but basically you can use smartphone technology to deliver safety training refreshers. You can use it as a source of advice. If they've got niggles, if they've got tightness, aches and pains, they can simply go into an app and receive advice from that. This is feedback from workers currently using our technology. We've said, what else do you want? And they said, yeah, if I feel a bit of tightness, it'd be nice to know what to do about it. Load-based rehab, imagine if we get to a point where you return a worker from injury, not based on the number of hours that the GP says they can do, saying they're, they're all right to go back to three hours a day, but if it's based on the percentage of load, which is what we do with athletes. You want to build them back up to 100% training load. So the first few week backs, you go 20%, 30%, 40% of the total load, chronic load. That'd be the perfect way to return workers from injury. First shift back or the first week back, they do 30% of the occupation load each shift. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're a long way from that where there's a lot of education that needs to happen, but it's the most accurate way of building, rebuilding the physical resilience of the worker 
to get them back to that um, pre-injury strength and condition. Post-workers comp claim monitoring, is, again, is another way that smartphone technology can be more effective. And engaging mental health and wellbeing monitoring, that's like a social component. If we can tie that in with the physical component of the data, that'd be really powerful. Increased use of the data, that acute chronic load ratio that I was talking about, once we've got enough data to really be able to identify that sweet spot, it'll be really powerful. Work task identification through data patterns. So each work task has a certain data pattern. We want to get to the point where if you overlay that over eight, nine, ten hours of a shift, you can see exactly what task they were doing at what point. Now, current problems with working from home. Now, this is more impactful for us, um, the safety industry professionals who do spend time behind a computer. Um, but also, this is more for, or this is also for the um, however many hundreds of thousands or millions around the world, office workers who are now out of the office, out of their ergonomic desk set up and they're, they're working from home. So as soon as this happened, I, the reason why we, we ventured down this path was because um, I ended up having a lot of back and neck pain after I started working from home and thinking that I'd set up my ergonomic workstation based on all of the guides and all the principles. I thought I was fine, but I was still getting neck and back pain. And so until I collected data, I realized that um, the ergonomic setup really wasn't right. So we started looking at building something to help other people identify that. So the current, the current problems with working from home, increased risk of musculoskeletal disorders, reduced physical activity, possibly, and the difficulty in creating a safe and productive environment, which is what happens at the workplace. You've got safety committees that make sure that the, the office is safe and it's a productive environment. You don't have that at home. So first of all, the increased risk of musculoskeletal disorders through sustained sitting. Now, there's some research that shows increase that, that there is an increased risk of msds with prolonged occupational sitting and here's a particular chart from 2018 that shows with prolonged sitting there's increased discomfort however more recent reviews have failed to support this theory because they've found that it's not the sitting position itself that increases the risk of musculoskeletal disorders it's the sustained posture so whether you're sitting standing kneeling if you're in a sustained posture, that's where there's a high risk of workstation-related musculoskeletal disorders. It's not just sitting. And a lot of that early research focused just on sitting. But it wasn't the sitting itself. It was the sustained posture that was increasing the risk of, of musculoskeletal disorder. So sustained postures do increase the risk, either sitting or standing or kneeling. This is due to prolonged isometric muscle contractions and muscle fatigue, increasing load on joints and connective tissue. So poor posture, poor sitting posture does not, decrease, does not indicate an increased risk of pain. So if you've got someone who's got clinically poor posture, that flexed position or that slouched position, they're at a higher risk of injury if you try to correct it. So setting up the workstation to suit their posture is the best way to reduce their risk of injury. And this is, this is shown by research. It's not just a matter of identifying poor posture and trying to correct it. It's about identifying the most efficient posture and having the ergonomic station suit that posture. Poor sitting posture does indicate poor ergonomics. And this is what we found. This is why we, we ventured down this path because I thought I'd set myself up on a good workstation until I collected video and data. And this was the source of my neck and back pain. You can see there, I'm sure a lot of you are already seeing a lot of the failures that, I've, that I had early on. The blue line is my trunk flexion position. So you can see this is over a 45 minute period from memory. You can see over that 45 minute period, my flexion position gradually increasing as determined, as confirmed by that, that picture at the, on, the, on the right. The yellow line is activity. So you can see I got up and I got moving. So there's no problem with that um, sustained posture. It was just that the ergonomic workstation was not set up correctly. And as a result, that's why I was slouching. And that's why I was getting back and neck pain. Reduced physical activity. Everyone knows about all this. Strong link between inactivity and all of these things. So you don't need me talking about all of that. However, research has shown those in sedentary occupations 
are the least sedentary outside work. So there's a more active outside work, approximately four hours a day. Those in vigorous occupations, the blue collar workers spend more time, more of their time outside of work being sedentary because they're tired and they're recovering from the physical demands of their work. Now that we're working from home, is this the case? We don't know. There are chances that now people are not commuting, they've got extra time, so they're more physically active. There's workers who are in physical occupations who may just be in the habit of being at home and not doing any physical activity. We don't know. So there's research needs to be done to see now how this new hybrid workforce working from home, mixed from home and office, actually changes our level of sedentary activity. So addressing the needs of the worker now working from home. We needed something that's valuable and reliable to measure movements. We needed data analysis to identify and reduce risks, but we needed to provide live feedback to drive behavior change. There's no point in just collecting data throughout the work. It's different with the blue collar workers. Collecting data throughout a full shift, a lot of the time feedback is effective to a point, but what's more valuable is measuring the physical demands of what they're doing throughout a shift. But that's not so much the case in the office. In the office, feedback is more important because if they're slouched, if they're getting slouch alerts or if they haven't moved for a while and they need to get up and moving, those alerts are more likely to prompt behavior change. And in combination with education and exercise, alerts alone um, become less effective after a while. If it's in combination with invaluable information and with exercise guidance, it can be really powerful. So we decided to address the needs of the worker using slouch alerts. So prompting posture correction for starters, but also identifying poor ergonomics. And this is what I needed. So if I got to the point where if, if you're wearing these sensors and you get too many slouch alerts, it's a clear indication that the ergonomic setup's not right. You haven't set up your workstation to be efficient for your posture. So by measuring that, it's a really good indicator that something needs to change. And by changing, the theory is you change your workstation, the next day you get less slouch alerts, basically reducing your, what's well, an indication that your risk of musculoskeletal disorders is decreased because you're not slouching. You're not drifting into that flexed position. Stretch alerts as well. A prompt after sustained postures, if the movement, if you've been in a sustained position for too long, whether it's sitting, standing, then an alert simply to prompt you to give a, have a quick stretch um, and provide specific exercises as the next step. So the, um, the exercises can actually add value and strengthen weaken areas or stretch tight areas. Step count is also something we added because we know that's a really good indicator of activity levels and progress tracking gamifications. So having scores, having leaderboards, having group challenges is really important. So addressing the needs of the employer, their goal is to reduce injury risk, a reduced risk of musculoskeletal disorders for their workers, whether they're at home or at work. So providing, I mean, I'm sure everyone's already been provided at one stage, it was a bit of a LinkedIn flood of people offering ergonomics um, workstations assessments. Um, so there's plenty of information around, plenty of free information around, checklists and all that sort of thing. Um, but I was, you know, I went through the checklist. I set up my workstation the way I thought I should have it. And until I collected data, I wouldn't have realised that it actually wasn't suited for, um, for my posture or my position. So, we want to, so the employer wants to make sure the workstation ergonomics are correct. The workers are avoiding sustained postures. And they want to try to create a safe, work environment. So we can identify slip, trips, falls risk through the data collected throughout a day and encouraging health and behaviour. So the stretch alerts do prompt people to get up and get moving. Maintaining working engagement is key. So if you get those team challenges, rewards, incentives, that should get people more active um, when they're working from home. But identifying and tracking progress and identifying trends is the key. The same as using Movement Coach to establish baselines and track workers' progress against baselines. It's the same as in the, as people working from home. If you're not collecting data and tracking it over time, then a lot of the value in the data, a lot of the, um, a lot of the insights are missed and the data is really wasted. You're not going to be able to reduce risk of musculoskeletal disorders if you're not tracking progress. But what about privacy? So 
as I said earlier, no GPS location, no health specific data is collected, heart rate, temperature, stress response, because workers didn't want that. However, there is a, behind our product and behind a lot of these products, there is a lot of data encryption. So there's a lot of IT security safety, but there's also the option for the worker to de-identify. So if there is concerns that the, the data is not gonna be used in the way it's intended to be used, then the worker can de-identify, meaning their, work, their data will still go into the averages to establish baselines, but it won't have their name attached to it. So the employer will still get the value out of it, the worker will still get the value out of it, but if they're concerned, then their privacy is maintained. This image on the, on the left, um, so I was in China late last year, I think early, mid last year, as part of a, um, as a, as part of an Oz industry um, project. And um, we went to a conference where they basically shared how they're using IoT to track people. So this particular image showed a building so they could zoom into a particular floor of the building and they could hone in on exactly which workers were in that building, who the workers had come, come across and what they did basically every second of their day. Now that's um, obviously intrusive, that'll never happen in the real world, but it is something that is possible now with CCTV. So it is something that, it is a legitimate concern about protecting people's privacy, especially when you start measuring their movements throughout the day. So where to start? How do you actually start looking at using wearable technology to reduce injury risks, whether it be for yourself, um, checking your posture at the workplace, uh, your home workstation, or whether it be for clients who have physically demanding work roles. Um, the best thing to do is start with a trial. Uh, there's, we do cost-effective trials. These days you can usually get your hands on some wearable technology. There's a couple of vendors out there now. Um, and a cost-effective trial to see the value of the data, to see how the workers respond to it is the key. So now that we've got this office coach feature, you can try it yourself by checking your posture at um, work and um, hopefully seeing the value in it. And over the next couple of months, we're explore, exploring links into the MyOSH platform so the data can feed straight in and it's all in one place so that um, it can be tracked and monitored with all of the other, all the other variables that are tracked and monitored in the, in the um, awesome MyOSH platform. So that's it. Um, hopefully you're all still there and still awake. I haven't um, sent too many of you to sleep with the, um, with some of the science behind it all. I think Scott, we're sitting up very straight at the moment. Very good. <laughs> Ten minutes ago, everyone corrected their posture. <laughs> um, we don't have any questions at the moment, so we'll we'll just wait a couple of seconds because sometimes people suddenly think of something um, at the end. There is a a question that's come through the chat panel um, now from Chelsea. Could I ask Scott what technology he trialed? Uh, we have our own sensor. So from early on, so when I transitioned from sports movement, or sports movement analysis and injury prevention across to the workplace, I used all the sports-based wearables and then realised that they're not cost-effective and they were providing too much information. So that was, which is what's needed in sports. You need uh, you need to measure absolutely everything because athletes are quite fine-tuned, and so if you miss, if you don't collect uh, enough information, you might miss something. But then I realised very early on that that wasn't, wasn't necessary in the workplace. I remember my first project I did for one of the large healthcare providers whereby I pro provided a report in the same way I would have provided a report for athletes, which was very detailed and very specific. And I thought it was great. I, from a sports science perspective, it was brilliant. But the, um, the client basically shook their head and said, well, this is a waste. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of money because we can't use this. We need something that's simple, that's easy to use, that the workers can actually understand. And so that's where over the next three, four years, we started to develop our own sensors, our own wearable technology. So it wasn't, it wasn't a matter of the sports wearables weren't addressing the need. It was just, we knew it had to be cost effective and the sports wearables were too expensive and not as, not as user friendly. So, we basically modified um, some accelerometers and gyroscopes and that's, that's where we collect our information. So we, we now um, make our own wearables. So 
if you um if you reach out we can send you a set to trial if you like okay great we don't have any other questions scott um I, I do uh, just want to remind everyone that we'll send out the slides and um, the video and the podcast um, if they want to share that around. Um, so if you have anything else to say, and we'll also send a link to your um, your website as well and an email address on that email. Great. Perfect. Well, thanks, right. thanks for your time, everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time too, Scott. Have a, have a great day, um, rest of the day for everyone. And um, I sent a link in the chat for future webinars. Um, Otherwise, have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Cheers.